Good evening. Welcome. This is Hot Edition. We're live. Money is up here at Adesawe Kanda. Also live across the world on 3news.com. You can listen to us on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and beyond and also on W93.5 in Wa and beyond. Coming up this evening here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Speaker of Parliament cited for contempt over anti-LGBTQ plus bill. The applicant is seeking sanctions against the speaker, Alban Bagwin. Tonight, we're here from some of the different views and sides on this matter and delve deeper into the issues. Also, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj, states clear its intent to challenge the High Court ruling which quashed the Commission's report and advice on issues related to the findings with the PPA former boss. ABAJ. We have details of this that exclusive interview with the Commissioner of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj. You're going to be hearing from him later this evening here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. And also the Attorney General accuses lawyers of James the equation of resorting to delaying tactics or to slow down its criminal trial. The latest from the court of law earlier today and matters arising this evening here on hot edition on 3fm 92.7 we have also coming up with the latest in business sports and entertainment share your thoughts with us as always we are very very interactive on a 3fm 927 on facebook twitter and instagram you can also listen to us as well on kiss me 107.1 in tamale and beyond welcome to the details now and the speaker of parliament alban sumana kinsford bagwin has been cited for contempt regarding the anti-lgbtq plus bill in a suit filed at the supreme court by one dr amanda odoi the applicant accused that the speaker of parliament has shown contempt and disregard for the constitution of the republic of ghana and court processes when he allowed the house to deliberate on the controversial bill when the matter is now a subject of litigation the court document stated that the speaker has continually violated and shown utter disregard for the 1992 constitution of the republic of ghana and the court processes and should therefore be sanctioned the applicant is one of two citizens who have sued the speaker of parliament and the attorney general over the anti-LGBTQ plus bill questioning its constitutionality. Let's go on to the telephone now. My colleague and our chief parliamentary correspondent, Komla Kluche, uh, is, is connecting with us shortly. Uh, we, we also have lawyer Bombi Banson on the line to share his thoughts with us on this. So um, we're going to go straight to lawyer Bobby Banson on, on the telephone on this. Uh, Bobby Banson, thank you so much for joining us here on hot edition do you find it unusual for the speaker to be cited for contempt of court while performing his duty as speaker when uh, this matter came before the floor of the house for debate well i i good, good, good evening alfred um and good evening to your listeners i and and viewers i, I unusual maybe daring <laughs> I would not say unusual. I, I would say rather daring because in the uh, democratic dispensation that we have, um, everybody has a right to test the law to the uh, best of its ability and its appreciation. And so daring maybe for me is the word, not necessarily unusual. I see. But the applicant makes reference to the pending court cases uh, with respect to this anti LGBT clock. Q plus bill, which we know, and and that while the cases were still ongoing, the speaker went ahead to allow first and second reading of the bill. It has also been argued elsewhere that the speaker cannot be stopped from from doing his work. What's the position of the law on, on a matter like this? Well, without um, attempting to prejudge the outcome of the contempt application, because if I'm not careful, then I may be. <laughs> 
in, in contempt of the Supreme Court myself by pre- making prejudicial comments. I, I think that the Constitution provides that um, there is freedom of proceedings in Parliament, um, and that may be interpreted to include actually the uh, readings that are done before a bill is passed. But we know that the Constitution is the, is the Supreme Court of the land. Um, the power of a, the jurisdiction of a court to convict a person for contempt can be invoked if it is, it is alleged that the respondent or the, the alleged contempt law, his actions uh, have, would, would prejudice the outcome of, of a matter before the court. And I believe that is the contention that the respondent is making, that he had filed an application for injunction to restrain the, the, Supreme, the, the, the Speaker of Parliament and Parliament for that matter from continuing with the promotion of the bill, i.e. taking further steps in, in making sure the bill is passed. And as long as that injunction has not been heard, if the Speaker proceeds or Parliament proceeds to promote the bill in that, in that um, contest, then it means that it will render the purpose of his injunction nugatory or otios. I believe that is the, the, the argument that is being made in this contempt application. And so then you would have to go to the general principle of law, that generally when an injunction application is served on a party, that party is obliged to now be restrained and not undertake the very thing that the injunction is seeking to restrain that person until the injunction application is determined, which could go right or go left. I mean, which could be dismissed or could be granted. And so if a party does so, then that does these actions is overreaching the court in terms of the injunction application. That is the general position of the law. Um, but there are instances where it's been said that when there is a constitutional mandate to carry out a duty, that constitutional mandate cannot be clocked by injunction. The Supreme Court has said that. And so, for instance, if, 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 if someone feels that the Chief Justice was not properly appointed, and so he files a suit for those reliefs, and include in those reliefs an injunction that the, the Chief Justice should be prevented from carrying out his duties. Because the duty of the Chief Justice to empanel members of the bench is constitutionally uh, vested in the Chief Justice. It's been contended in some circles that the dependency of the injunction cannot prevent the Chief Justice from carrying out that constitutional mandate. And so if the Speaker's um, uh, role that is being challenged or that is being questioned by means of this injunction, is, is he's carrying out that role by virtue of his constitutional mandate, as a Speaker of Parliament, then the argument now would be whether or not an injunction could be used to clock the exercise of, a, of not a discretion, but actually an obligation vested in a person or on a person by the Constitution. So it depends on how, how you can look at it. I, I believe, in my humble opinion, that these are the considerations that may, that may come to play. But consistently, we've seen the, the Legislative House of Parliament and indeed the Speaker make reference to the suppression of powers and the fact that the judiciary cannot tell or direct the legislature on how it has to do its work, not to talk about injuncting the Speaker in performing his constitutional duty as Speaker of Parliament. So without without going into the merits of this case, and we are mindful of the limitations, so we're not cited for sub judicate. But if you look at these specific, you know, cases where, for instance, in the previous case of the the narcotics, uh, uh, that's a law. This bill that was eventually passed and the amendments that were made, and uh, the Supreme Court uh, just two weeks ago took a decision caution how the process that parliament employed violated some basic principles. Parliament corrected that. It's, it's gone through now and it's eventually passed into law. But there was that specific reference of the separation of powers. Now, will that also be an argument that can come to play in this particular case where the speaker 
is performing his duty regardless of his personal position being known about this particular bail this anti lgbtq plus bail he's performing his constitutional duty and then there is an injunction and then also citing him for contempt lawyer yes i i i, I agree with the the separation of powers theory as demonstrated to a large extent in the constitution but the constitution also does also makes room for um, um, checks and balances. That is why the Constitution says that if anything is done or, or purported to be done that is in breach of the Constitution, um, somebody may go to the Supreme Court for a declaration that that act is a nullity. And so even though Parliament is mandated by the Constitution to pass laws or bills uh, for president to assent, if someone is of the opinion that that act, that bail, is in breach of a constitutional provision, that person will go to Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to make the necessary declarations and all that. And so, yes, there is separation of powers, but the same constitution makes room for checks and balances. And so, to the extent, that is why I started by saying that the Supreme, the constitution is the Supreme Court of the land. We are all subject to it. Whether you are the head of the executive, you are the head of the judiciary or you are head of the legislative arm of government, you are subject to the constitution. If, in, if anybody feels that your actions, whether it is authorized by a statute or not, is in contradiction with the constitution, that person has the right to go to court to seek a declaration. I believe what is being discussed here is whether or not pending the determination of, of, of an action for a declaration that an act is unconstitutional, whether that person who is the subject matter of that dispute is now can now be restrained from carrying out his constitutional mandate. I believe that is the very interesting legal uh, 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 discussion that I'm looking forward to, the interpretation and application by the Supreme Court. Fantastic point there. Oya Bobby Bansing, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Great. And let's go straight to Parliament and, and find out if the Speaker has been served as yet. Our Chief Parliamentary Correspondent, Komla Kluche, is joining us. Komla, what's the latest on this? Do you have any news of the Speaker being served with this um, contempt of court case? Hello, Komla? Hey, I can hear you off it. Great. Off it, I can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's clear now. So just a short while ago, before going on air, I just made my last check at the Speaker's Secretariat. The indication I get is that Speaker Alban Suman Bagbin has been served the content suit. And uh, it went through the clerk. Normally, when, when suits like this come, if an MP or even the Speaker himself or even the whole institution is sued, it goes through the clerk and then the clerk looks at it it's referred uh, to or it's, it's, it's looked at by the legal department uh, who, who are responsible for the whole institution and also all the MPs, even though they may have their personal lawyers. But once you are an MP, you are a, a parliamentary service staff, it goes through that rudiment where you, uh, uh, the legal department will have to look at it and then you are properly uh, 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 notified of it. So just a short while ago, we confirmed that, yes, indeed, the speaker has been served through his uh, secretary. He went to the clerk and it's got into him. But what it is is that once the speaker has been served, well, I mean, it's the whole institution, but it's the speaker who has been cited here. And so the speaker would, would have to make a representation, you know, uh, when, when that case is so called. And if it's so-called, it possibly would mean that the speaker himself would have to be in the dock then. Uh, what my understanding is that if this goes uh, to the push where the speaker is convicted of a, 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 a prison term, Speaker Bagman would, would be the one that would go in for it, irrespective of the fact that you know it was an, a, a whole institution that both the MPs, uh, together with him, that, that had this, this debate or discussion done on it. It's the speaker who is the head of the institution, and that is the one who would suffer the consequences uh, where, where, 
where there's a conviction of a prison term of the sort. So that is the understanding we get that he's been served, and that is the processes that it goes through. Kumlak, some good detail there. Thank you very much. It's our Chief Parliamentary Correspondent, Kumlak Kloche, indeed confirming that uh, as we speak, Alban Sumana, Kingsford Bagwin, Speaker of Parliament, has been served with this contempt of court suit filed at the Supreme Court by one Dr. Amanda Odoi, the applicant arguing that Speaker Alban Bagwin has shown contempt and disregard for the Constitution of the Republic and court processes when he allowed the House as Parliament to deliberate on the controversial bail when the matter is now a subject of litigation. So that's the update to it. Now we'll see how things play out. But this is about the, the third court case against this anti-LGBTQ plus bail. Away from that, the Commission on Human Rights Administrative Justice Charge says it will challenge the High Court ruling which quashed its report and the adverse findings against former PPA boss ABAJ as a public procurement authority, according to the court presidable by Justice Audrey Tay. Shraj violated the fair hearing rule by substituting portions of the original complaint filed by the Ghana Integrity Initiative with its own allegations. It further concluded that Shraj failed to provide the applicant, ABAJ, with the opportunity to cross-examine the witnesses called during the investigation before reaching their conclusions. Reacting to the decision, Commissioner for the Commission on Human Rights and Justice, Justice Shraj, Joseph Wittal, said the court erred in its decision. The Commission's lawyers are waiting for the written judgment in order to study it and take the necessary action. But you can rest assured that on the merits of that judgment, we could go on appeal. I have not had the judgment itself. Our lawyers are waiting for the judgment. On the basis of what, when we study the judgment, the possibility of appealing to the court of appeal is very high. That's the Commissioner for Shraj, Joseph Vital there. But what does the latest ruling mean for the work of the Commission and, and how it operates? Now, shortly, we'll be joined by lawyer Vitus Bangs uh, to have a quick one on this, and especially this position that Shraj has taken to uh, seek a redress or uh, appeal this particular ruling. And uh, lawyer Martin Pebble would also join us shortly on, on this the particular development with respect to Shraj. And and if you just joined us, the Commission on Human Rights Administrative Justice, Shraj, says it will challenge the High Court ruling which quashed its report and the adverse finding against a former PPA boss, uh, ABAJ, according to the court presided over by Justice Audrey Tay. Shraj violated the fair hearing rule by substituting uh, portions of the original complaint filed by the Ghana Integrity Initiative with its own allegations. In fact, the court further concluded that Shraj failed to provide the applicant, ABAJ, with the opportunity to cross-examine the witnesses called during the investigation before reaching their conclusion. Let's go on to the telephone now, and Martin Pebo is a private legal practitioner, He's joining us. Uh, Martin Pebo, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on All Hot Edition. Th these are the, the reasons why the court uh, says... Uh, Hello. Let me do the shard matter and comment. Give me 10 minutes. Okay. Lawyer Martin Pebble uh, is, is getting ready to join us shortly. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Now, yeah. the, 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 the reason why the High Court quashed the report and the advert findings against the former public procurement authority boss, ABAJ, according to the, the records of the court we have, uh, is that. Uh, Justice Audrey Tay says Shraj violated the fair hearing rule by substituting mm. portions of the original complaint filed by the Ghana Integrity Initiative with its own allegation. It also further mm. concluded that Shraj failed to provide the applicant, ABAJ, with the opportunity to cross-examine the witnesses called during the investigation before reaching their conclusion. So... Really, how is this going to impact on the work of the commission that from, from what you know in terms of how it works and, and how they also gather their, their evidence against a particular issue? Hello? The last part, the last sentence I missed it. 
I was asking how this particular ruling and the issues that they raised, which led to the court's conclusion, will impact on the commission's work going forward. Okay. Yeah, so naturally, when you lose a court case, eh, it can disorient you and the same for an institution. Of course, the institution is manned by human beings. So it's to be expected that uh, immediately after, in the short term, it would disorient the organization. They would be demoralized and, you know, other negative effects. But that's the nature of life, right? When you lose something, that is important to your career or to the institution's goals, the institution's mandate, etc. right? Yes. So what you would see immediately is that there's going to be an appeal. Yes, because um, with this kind of um, situation, the law has to be tested and tested, and then finally you have the Supreme Court coming. Because, you see, sometimes what happens is that Shraj uses the same method. They will write to you, what are your comments on this? All right, and then based on the comments, they will do further investigations and come to a conclusion. So some have argued that Shraj doesn't usually allow cross examination the way it is done in court. So that's the argument of some. And so now that it has come out specifically, I think the best way to deal with it is to let the case travel to the court of appeal and then to the Supreme Court, so that. Uh, we would see what the Supreme Court finally has on it. Because that's very, very important. Because the, the, this judgment expands the frontiers of the law by saying that, oh, he should be allowed to cross-examine. And here is a case, Shrag is saying, no, cross-examination is usually not done. They are not a court of law. They are not a court of law like uh, the, the court that gave the judgment. So because Shrad is not a court of law, they don't usually allow cross-examination like this, right? So in that case, okay, then let the court of appeal look at it. And and then subsequently, whoever wins uh, and the other party is not happy, and let it get to the Supreme Court. This matters at least. This is not the end of life. So that, that's the way to go, appeal and appeal. See, but if you look at the reasons or the reasoning behind the judge's ruling on this matter, talking about the fact that ABAJ should have been given the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses that Shraj relied on, as well as uh, also be the issue about a fair trial. I mean, you know how Shraj does his work. That's the conclusions of the judge now raise fundamental questions about the modus operandi of Shraj's own investigative procedure that leads to conclusions they make on particular cases. Now, so as I mentioned, Shraj has been doing the work in a certain uh, manner, as they said, that they don't usually grant uh, cross-examination, and that has been made. So now it means that the procedure has come under uh, attack, okay, or it's come under scrutiny. So that's why I said in the first submission that the best way is then to let it go on appeal. Now that we have also heard it, you know, we will do further research to check other uh, uh, anti corruption agencies, other human rights organizations, what did they do? So that if we find that oh, around the world they allow cross examination, then why not? Should that can modify. If the search around the world also shows that no, nobody allows uh, cross examinations and all that, then that one too, uh, it, it will have a bearing on the next court decision. Yeah, so, by all means, it's good that the debate is started. Yes. Yeah, and it's important that you make that point. And, and you say that this is subject for research, is it not? Um, so mm -hmm. as to understand why the judge would make such a conclusion about fair, fair hearing, especially. Because the judge doesn't do cross-examination in, in, this, in this process of work, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. At least we have that yeah. clarity on the constitutional provision on this matter because we've just been combing through the 1992 constitution and the provisions for charge and and it's consistent with what you've just said about they not not doing cross examination. So at what point could ABAJ, if what the judge is saying is anything to go by, have been giving that that opportunity to cross examine the witnesses? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So let let's look at it. I think let's give the opportunity for the uh, this matter to go on appeal. Then we will see. That's how the law develops. Yes. That's how the law develops. I think this is not the first time. You know, there have been decisions in the past. You know, Shiraj, as for Shiraj, there have been several cases involving Shiraj which have gone to the Supreme Court. You remember the Anani case, um, ex party, uh, Kwame Addo. Yes, uh, also a, a decision by Shiraj that Kwame Addo, uh, listen, challenged to the Supreme Court. Uh, it wasn't granted, you know. Then uh, you look at, uh, as I mentioned, the Anani case. You see, the Anani case, at least, though we're not happy at all with the uh, most of the opinion, right? At least, we've got the uh, Supreme Court saying that when it comes to abuse of office, that one, there's no need for complainant, right? Then subsequently, the Shiraj even amended, and so now there are things that Shiraj can do without a complainant. So the Anani case, though we're not happy Anani got off, but at least it strengthens Shiraj because at least the Supreme Court said when it comes to abuse of office, there's no need for a complainant. And then also Shiraj subsequently made with uh, uh, the CI. It was a new CI that accommodated those things. So the litigation helps. Look, when you compare around the world, that's how democracies are built. The litigation, one side loses, goes on appeal, and etc. Then through that, decisions are made and then the institutions grow. Yes. yes. Even when you lose, even when you lose, it's also a form of growth because then it means that maybe there's uh, something that institution was doing was not good and so now they'll put a stop to it. So, yeah. and, and that means that then society will become better. So whichever way right. uh, this decision goes, it's growth. Yes, mm. it shouldn't just be seen as, oh, Shrag lost. No, 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 no. I think that, as I've said, because there have been several cases involving Shrag that went to the Supreme Court and those decisions have helped to strengthen Shrag and to make it a better institution, this one too should go through the process, Court of Appeal, and then to the Supreme Court. Yeah. And yes, and great point. And you talk about the the impact on both ways, whether win or lose. And and also, I've had some anti corruption crusaders uh, talk about the impact of of this particular ruling on the fight against corruption. And this is something that I know that you 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 have been at the forefront of when it comes to the fight against corruption. Now, considering how this case traveled, starting from the investigative journalists uh, Manasseh Azuri Awone's work which Shraj launched on used it as a basis to conduct its own investigations and then traveled up until the court that the court has made this judgment will this outcome in any way impact on the fight against corruption from where you sit oh absolutely so it's uh, just like the way I said the first time I, 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 I can understand anti-corruption agencies, yes, and all of us, I'm also very deeply involved in that area. There will be a disappointment, but as I said, this is not the end of the world. This is not the end. So we should let it go on appeal. Yes, we should let it go on appeal. Then we'll see uh, where to, you know, draw the line. Mm -hmm. Then just be careful. Otherwise, you see, we would talk and talk and there may be say things that shouldn't be said. True. Let's, 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 let's wait. Let's wait. Let's not also forget that, at least as we speak now, even if he, the fact that Manato got the documentary out alone, even made Ghana a better place because it showed that we're fighting something. So people got uh, to know that, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, people got to know what was happening, people were not happy, though actually what I heard was a norm that usually people in institutions will get contracts, you know, but at least the expose made our society better because it now opened people's eyes. And then since then there's been litigation, you see, on countless occasions, this case has been referenced in the media. That in itself now is teaching us a lesson, whether uh, the contracts it's a great company, the talent discovery and etc. got were legal or illegal. There are other angles, it's not only legality. So there are various ways of analyzing it. There's the moral aspect, there's the political one, then there's the legal. So on the moral front, that one, citizens have concluded it that no, we can't allow this because 
the officer was in the office, was being paid, and then his companies were making money. So the moral uh, case has already been decided in the court of public opinion. It doesn't matter how a court of law looks at it. So, and, that, and so as I'm saying, we've gone forward because, trust me, his successor will be foolish to attempt to do such a thing. Yes, his successor would run from such a thing. That he would be careful that nothing associated with his name would come before the board for contract. Yes, yeah, because of the way we've held it, uh, 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 this uh, ADAD case. So that is good. So let's look at it. I don't, as I said, well, the decision, yes, as I said, let's go on a few. The bigger one is the moral one, that first one, that we've got to know that, okay, yes. So uh, apart from being public officer, you also had companies that were benefiting, getting big, big contracts, and they were, you see, that case, that's not all of it. There are, there are other angles, but that's where the biggest victory was won. The moral side that, no, mm. don't let this thing happen too much. One man, you can't benefit too many times like that. That is the strongest part. As for court of laws, you can never predict, so you are careful. So let's delineate the various angles. Right. Yes. Let's delineate the various ones. No, 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 no. The biggest thing was for the whole expose to have been aired and it showed that oh this is how we have always known it that it happens but at least for the citizens it appears that citizens who are not close to government and don't hear things that was the first time that they saw scientifically oh that yes it's true people in big positions use the positions for their personal aggrandizement and then the citizens are left to wallow in poverty that is a suspicion that has always long been held but in recent times, there's not been a scientific proof of it. And this one turned out to be that one. So that was the biggest result that we got in the court of uh, public opinion, the moral angle. So we are saying that stop this. And we don't want any minister. We don't want any deputy executive. We don't want any electoral commissioner. We don't want any Bank of Ghana, governor, etc., etc., benefiting like that. And that is the strongest. So it doesn't matter what a court of law decides. No, no. It doesn't matter what the court of law decides. So the rest will be scared that, oh, citizens are saying they don't want this thing. Citizens are getting wiser. If you continue doing this, you don't know when you'll be caught. You see? Yeah. Yes. Oya well, Martin Pebo, I thank you so much for your thoughts on this, You're as welcome. always. It's a private legal practitioner. And if you just joined us here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7, in a significant judgment delivered, uh, the High Court presided over by Justice Audrey Tame has quashed a report by the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj, that contained adverse findings against the former Chief Executive Officer of the Public Procurement Authority, ABAJ. The court ruled that Shraj violated that fair hearing rule by substituting portions of the original complaint filed by the Ghana Integrity Initiative with its own allegations. So that's what lawyer Martin Pebo has been sharing his thoughts on. Let's go straight to the court of law uh, today. And Deputy Attorney General Afetia Yeboa has accused lawyers of James Echequation, Member of Parliament for the Asin North constituency, of resorting to delaying tactics to slow down his criminal trial. This was after lead counsel for Asin North MP told an Accra High Court they have filed an application at the Supreme Court to quash the ruling of the court regarding the daily hearings of the trial. This is Alfred Chaya Boa earlier in court today as my colleague Lord Edwasari brought us details. Thank you very much. We came to court this morning only to be told that the accused person, increased counsel, had found an application one, had a court of appeal seeking to stay proceedings, and then two, an application to the Supreme Court seeking to quash and prohibit the judge from hearing the matter. Now, for practice, if you first set an application, it does not make us take proceedings. So we made a point that notwithstanding the fact that these applications have been filed, the judge will be right in proceeding to hear the case by asking that preservation be done on PW. The judge, after listening to us, said it should be given a ruling on that specific issue on Tuesday. I mean, what does your office make of the fact that for almost a month now, you have virtually not been able to make any progress on this work and the AG makes the point that it appears there is some attempts to halt the trial effectively. 
that's the point. There's an attempt to delay proceedings through the legal process, which will say fine, it's within their right to use the legal process to fight their cause. But that doesn't mean that when they, they, they file such applications, the court must wait for them for the application to move to the appellate court or the Supreme Court. So we are concerned about that. But we are ready. If I told you last week, we come to court to speak law. This morning, we have spoken law in court. Tuesday, we know what the judge will say, whether the judge will agree with us or disagree with us. Well, that's Deputy Attorney General Afe Boa, but uh, Director of Legal Affairs of the NDC, who was also in court, lawyer Ibrahim Maleba, reacted to this position by the Deputy Attorney General. Because the rules are that you must fully disclose. But in this case, the Attorney General did some half. But in this case, the Attorney General did some half disclosures. Director of Legal Affairs of the NDC, lawyer Abraham Maleba, there. And again, today, the minority in parliament once again chose to boycott the business activities in, in, of the House in order to accompany their colleague James Jatikwason to court. This marks the third time the caucus has abandoned the parliamentary proceedings in support of the Member of Parliament for the Asin North constituency, despite a ruling by the Speaker of Parliament, Abam Bagbing, a couple of days ago, stating that the boycott is a violation of the standing orders of, the, of Parliament due to the minority's failure to seek official permission the group remains steadfast in their actions. Kingsley Nyakon, the member of parliament for Kwadaso, expressed dissatisfaction with the continuous absence of the minority caucus from parliament in order to show their solidarity with their colleagues facing prosecution in court. But the NDC MPs say, regardless of the speaker's position on this matter, they are resolute and they will continue to boycott the business of parliament Whenever James Atequason, Collins Dauda, and the minority leader himself, Dr. Kate Forcing, appear in court. Let's go on to the telephone now. And Dr. Rashid Rahman, as the director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs, is joining me. Dr. Rashid Rahman, thank you so much for your time. Now, this is this is what's happened again. This is the third time. This is even after the speaker has has made his position quite clear on, on this that he cannot m accept the minority's absence as being with permission but the minority mps together with the leadership say they have resolved to continue to boycott the business of the house what 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 would lead to a compromise or a change of mind in your view if the speaker's position hasn't even changed that well i think what what would lead to perhaps a resolution of this alfred as i said uh, i mean it's going to be some dialogue and some consensus i mean uh, amongst the leadership I don't think that they have sat down as a group to look at this as a problem that affects the house and uh, to try and see how they can dialogue and resolve it. Um, I haven't uh, seen anything uh, that effect. And Alfred, my fear is, you see, like uh, your reporters are saying today, most of them were not in the house, or they, they were not in the house, actually. Uh, and they were not in the court. So is this going to be used as an excuse for members to check their responsibility to be in the house? Is this going to be used as an excuse by other members who are already kind of, uh, you know, um, guilty of not attending to the house? to use this as an advantage, you know, to join those who have sent themselves. Because today I understand there were uh, less than 50 members in the House. I mean, that is if you counted from both sides. Um, my fear is, Alfred, my fear is, if we are not careful, somebody will run to the Supreme Court, and uh, and then the court once again will, will get involved in giving Parliament instructions in terms of what to do in order to to uh, resolve this matter. So, for me, I think I'll go back to my starting point, that this strategy, I think uh, they need to think about it very, very carefully. And they need to perhaps sit down with, you know, the other side. And let me be quick to add, Alfred, that the other side, that's the majority side, also has a responsibility. 
Because at the end of the day, if we don't get business done, they have the mandate of the people to run this country. Uh, they will take a big share of the blame because when you are elected to lead, I mean, you don't only lead when things are easy and simple. You also lead when there are difficulties. And this is where we want to see some leadership because it's a crisis. And uh, the last thing we want is for people to begin giving up on this whole uh, democracy that uh, we've been trumpeted uh, for as as, uh, as a leader uh, in this continent and beyond. So it's an important reference point because, yes, indeed, the, based on the reports of, from our parliamentary correspondent and also our court correspondent, not all the 137 NDC MPs were actually in court and you couldn't find them as well in parliament. Now, what, what would you ask of the leadership of the minority in a situation like this? Because the only reason why they are even on this path is that they want all their members to be at a particular place at a particular mm. time mm. when there's a court hearing. Mm. And, and, and yet they are not there, but also not in parliament. What should the leadership be seen to be doing? Well, I think the leadership should be seen to wanting to make sure that their front is united. You see, when you start talking about this, then people are very quick to say you are going back to old issues, uh, Alfred. But you want to make sure that if this is a strategy, then perhaps, first of all, all the members of your caucus are on board, fully on board. Because if you go to court, I mean, we have been seeing the, the pictures that you've been bringing to us, to our homes. I mean, we know the people who go to court. I mean, those who show up in solidarity with, with Honorable Kwesin and, 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 the, and the other uh, NDC MPs. I mean, we know, we see their faces. Where are the rest? Does that suggest that some of them are not behind their leaders? Does that suggest that this is not a, a kind of a strategy that everybody from within the minority caucus has bought into it? Uh, perhaps maybe the only thing that is stopping some of them from attending parliament is uh, maybe they fear the repercussions from the party. Because otherwise, I believe that if it was uh, maybe everybody given the opportunity to decide what they want to do, either to go to court or to go to parliament, uh, perhaps maybe we'll see a number of them coming to the house. Because some of them are also getting pressure. They are also getting questions from their constituents. And they know what awaits them, Alfred. They know what awaits them if uh, at the end of the day, their constituents begin to turn, turn against them. But not only that, Alfred, I think most importantly, the Ghanaian swing voter, because uh, his, his take on whatever happens is what determines whether NDC will be in power or MPP will be in power. So they need to keep all these factors in mind as they pursue this strategy. Dr. Rashid Raman, I thank you so much for your thoughts on this. Appreciate it. Thank you is executive director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Let's stay with Parliament. And Parliament yesterday commenced debate on the private member's bill to have the death penalty abolished and removed from the country's statute books. The bill sponsored by Medina Member of Parliament, Francis Xavier Susu, generated intense argument on the floor with two MPs from both sides urging the House not to consider this particular private member's bail. The Speaker has to end the debate for continuation in coming days as emotions run high in Parliament yesterday. Here are excerpts from the debate in Parliament. Also have judiciary consensus because, Mr. Speaker, when you look at the case of um, Dexter Johnson versus the Republic, um, the Leonard Justice do JSC made the recommendation that it is time for Ghana to move away from the use of the death penalty. All the consensus that we have built over the years supports the fact that it is time for Ghana to amend the um, eight laws so that it can align with our practices. Mr. Speaker, 
With this, I beg to move. We are a de facto abolitionist state in the sense that even though we have the death penalty on the statute books, we rarely execute those who have been sentenced to death and are, you know, sent to death row in our prisons. Meaning that our presidents have been very cautious about putting into action the convictions obtained in death penalty cases. You come to my house 1 a.m. and disturb my sleep and that of my family. I'm a prayer will you take my life. You even rape my wife in the process, extra, extra. That fellow, life imprisonment. But you attempt to abrogate, abrogate this constitution or to disturb a uh, flagstaff house, then after that one, you will die. That is discriminatory. And I see with the government of the day, we are minded. If they were minded to abolish the death penalty in the country, they would have come by way of amendment. They should have passed said this. Muslims and Christians, we all believe in the eye for an eye. But in, 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 in certain instances where you will see that, or you are very much aware that if I kill somebody, I will still be alive. People end up uh, ending people's lives or shortening people's lives with an excuse that if I end your life, I wouldn't be killed. I think that for the fact that no president or for a while, we have not been able to execute anybody. We should still leave this in our books. We should leave it because it will serve as a deterrent to others. These are some of the excerpts of the debate in parliament, and it's time for business now. Nanekia Mensa Brampa is standing by with the latest in the world of business here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us on Hot Edition and thanks for staying with us. Time for business now with me, Nana Ikuya Mensa Brampa. And beginning with this evening, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of Ghana is expected to maintain its policy rate at 29.5% at its upcoming 113th meeting. Research lead at GCB Capital, Courage Boti, notes despite an increase in headline inflation in the last two months, he expects the policy rate to be maintained to support growth and general economic activity. I think the Bank of Ghana's outlook for inflation will be one of a medium to long term outlook and not just the immediate really. I largely think the shocks to inflation over the last two months are temporal in nature and they will uh, uh, wane off over time really. And so given the fact that growth is distressed, yes, but a one growth surprise positively, monetary tightening is also in place and so you do not have exactly policy support for growth. And the only way we could sustain job creation is to encourage credit. And a, a good way to do that, giving the inflation consent now would be to maintain the policy rate where it is so that you can guide the market towards credit creation really. And that is what I expect to be the policy stance sometime after the, the meeting next week. And that was the lead analyst at GCB Capital there, Courage Booty. Now, you may have been paying more than double or triple the prices of some commonly used household items, including fresh tomatoes and garden eggs. That's because the June 2023 inflation figure, some, uh, some commonly used items have featured in the top 20 items with the highest inflation rates, some above 100%. My colleague, Menuafo, has been engaged in some market women. It's, it's too expensive, but I know how to do the customer. The customer will not leave me and go. I, I might say it's expensive because people were complaining. 
you couldn't buy a lot because the but this thing, the big cap is expensive. I bet ton. Now see can the crowd the cut toy and where answer. We were incurring losses all the time. Now see how cut off. Until you have problem, baby. I'm not going to say pa. I'm not going to say I'm not going to do. Customers complain bitterly about the prices, but they still buy. Yes, I'm not going to because I'm not going to. And still on the same subject, Anthony Morrison is the CEO of Agribusiness. The Agribusiness Chamber has been talking about it. At the start of every production season, we need to know what quantity and uh, size of land that is production, that is into production for food security, purposely for uh, local consumption. And what other uh, lands have been earmarked for production for export. That must be be done because if we don't do that one day we we'll wake up to realize that all our food has been exported out of the country and we have, we have to pay more uh, to, to to consume the little that are left and so that was anthony morrison he is the ceo of the agribusiness chamber and just before we go uh fitch solutions says that until ghana bounces back strongly we would have to adhere to all the imf uh, program lineup for us, and he is Dr. Saad. Let's hear him speak. All the policies that are outlined, the government will have to focus on those policies because if, if if government is not committed to those policies, then we wouldn't be able to achieve this fixed rating, this new rating, or this new projection of 5.7 percent budget deficit. And in all of that, I would say that the biggest thing government should focus on is physical dif discipline. Up to date, the fund hasn't been set up, which That's is still a worry because you need the financial sector to be able to boost up business growth in your economy so that you'll be able to achieve the full macroeconomic, I mean, macroeconomic recovery that you are aiming at. And if that is not done, then there's going to be a setback in achieving this new targets that is being mentioned by FIX. Dr. Sahad Idriso is with the Louisiana Economic Development in USA. He says that a strong recovery of Ghana's fiscal economy can only be realized if government adheres to policy measures outlined by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, under the bailout program. When you log on to 3news.com, we have more business news updates. That's it for Business on Hot Edition with me, Nana Ikuya Mensah Brampayel for Sulabi is ready to give us the latest in the world of sports. Yeah. Most definitely, Ekia, thank you so much. And uh, straight into the sports news, and let's start with the Black Stars, where midfielder Majida Shimeru revealed his disappointment at missing out on the 2022 FIFA World Cup. He, however, was pleased to see Mohamed Kudus and others light up the stage in Qatar. Yeah, that's the biggest competition in the world, and I think every player wants to. And uh, I think for me personally, I felt, I felt bad, but also I felt like, yo, these are my guys going, and, uh, and they need... I need my support because Missy in Sal is like like doing really well in the World Cup makes me feel happy because he is someone that I I always talk to, I always work with, like about so uh, I mean this guy is like Kudus and Kudus is like a little brother because we grew up in the same in the same uh, hood and uh, me seeing them makes me happy, even though I'm not there. Uh, I mean personally that's that's me not supporting my brother. So I felt like yeah, just let it go. There's there's more ahead, there's better days coming. So uh, personally, I felt bad, but also I felt like yeah, these are my guys, and uh, I mean, they need my support. So, yeah. Well, that's Majida Shimeru, the midfielder for the Black Stars, and a full interview will be aired exclusively on, th on TV3 uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Now, away from the men's national team to the women's national team, the Black Queens are currently leading Guinea by two goals to zero in the Olympic qualifiers. The first goal was scored by Vivian Ejei Kunedu inside 20 minutes, and the second was scored by Priscilla Dubia um, in the 27th minutes of the game. Now, in Europe, ex-Manchester City footballer Benjamin Mendy has been cleared of raping a woman and attempting to rape another. Now, it comes after he was cleared of six rape charges uh, at an earlier trial in January. Now, this is what he had to say to the press after his release. And football fans around the world just would like to hear a few words from you about how you feel. Alhamdulillah. Ben, well done. Ben, where does this leave your football career? You, ready to, you look fit, you're ready to start playing again. 
But that was the only thing Benjamin Mendy had to say. He said, Alhamdulillah. Now, al- Alhamdulillah, which is Arabic for praise be to God, the only word Benjamin Mendy said after his release. Now, let's move on to some European transfers where Arsenal have officially announced the signing of Euron Timba, uh, who signed a six-year deal. Timba is the second signing completed by the Gunners in the uh, winter window, in the summer transfer window. Now, here are his first words. Arsenal. I think it was because of my brothers. They always uh, were an Arsenal fan. Um, and I just loved uh, seeing Arsenal play. Uh, they had big players. Uh, the way they play, the style. I just, I just loved the club. And uh, yeah, I had it from, uh, from a young age. But uh, my brothers uh, kind of put it. Well, that's Arsenal's new signing there. His name is Julian Timba. And he's joined the North London side for the next season. He comes after Kai Havertz's signing was completed. And uh, in the next few days, Declan Rice will also be confirmed by Arsenal. And uh, just a few things holding that up. But let's head to tennis, where Novak Djokovic reached the Wimbledon men's singles final for the fifth successive year with the dominant win in the last four over Yannick Sinner, the Italian. Now, second seed Djokovic won 6 3, 6 4, 7 6, 7 4 against the Italian eighth seed, leaving him one victory away from a record equaling eighth men's title. Carlos Alcaraz also defeated Daniel Medvedev in three sets uh, to book his place in the Wimbledon final. The Spaniard won 6 3, 6 3, 6 3. And in a women's division as well, Ange Jabeur, the Tunisian, will take on Marketa Vondrusova in the final on Saturday. That match will begin at 1 p.m. My name is Yao of Fusulabi, and that's all the sports here on Hot Edition. We'll see you sometime. Accra gets busy on this frequency. 92.7, 3FM. Ghana, brace yourselves for another electrifying season of Ghana.